Cutting cash flows to terrorists is the aim of a new UN resolution Russia is set to file, with Islamic State's oil income being the main target. The U.S. is to send more troops to Iraq as part of its fight against ISIL, though it is fueling concerns of a mission creep. We're not going to be friendly to anyone who's non-white and wants to live amongst us. It's real simple. Meet Craig Cobb, a U.S. white supremacist. RT's Maria Fanoshna hears his first-hand account and speaks to those trying to derail his radical ideas. midday in Moscow here on RT International. Thank you very much for joining us. We have your latest top world headlines. Russia is preparing a draft UN resolution on cutting off financing to terrorist groups, including Islamic State. Moscow's ambassador to the United Nations, Vitaly Cherkin, says the draft is a follow-up to a resolution passed back in February aimed at cracking down on ISIL sales of oil, antiquities, and the use of hostages for ransom money. Now, according to reports, the jihadi group makes up to one and a half million dollars every day from black market fuel exports. The Russian government says it has proof the vast majority of the oil sold by the terrorists does make its way through to the Middle East via Turkey, something Ankara denies. Earlier, my colleague Daniel Hawkins heard from Paul Vallely, a retired U.S. Army Major General. He thinks world powers simply need to put pressure on the Turkish government. The key is to destroy ISIS, and one of the uh, initiatives that Ambassador Cherkin should be moving towards uh, uh, with the Security Council is Erdogan in Turkey. He's been supporting ISIS uh, since I was over there several years ago. I, I've met some of the black marketeers along the Syrian border there in Hatay province. What role could the Free Syrian Army play in shutting off those oil routes and thus shutting off uh, the Islamic State's lifeline effectively? Well, since they're out uh, there, primarily in Aleppo, when you go over to Raqqao and you go where the oil fields are in eastern Syria, they certainly could align with uh, uh, certain forces that are there, uh, the Russians, if they would uh, so be inclined to do it. But Erdogan's a problem. He really is. And if I was Ambassador Cherkin, not only would I uh, propose something to the Security Council for cutting off the finances, but also doing some kind of uh, action against Erdogan. He is a very, very negative force in that area. And later today, the Russian Defense Ministry will be outlining its strategy for combating the rise of extremist groups in the Middle East. Here on RT International, we'll bring you the news conference live at midday GMT. In the meantime, the U.S. has announced it is pouring more troops into Iraq to fight Islamic State. At the Pentagon chief briefing Congress on his plans. In full coordination with the government of Iraq, we're deploying a specialized expeditionary targeting force to assist Iraqi and Kurdish Peshmerga forces and put more, even more pressure on ISIL. These special operators will, over time, be able to conduct raids, free hostages, gather intelligence, and capture ISIL leaders. This force will also be in a position to conduct unilateral operations in Syria. The extra troop deployment has been making some headlines, with questions raised over the effectiveness of the recent campaign. Details now with RT's Gaine Chichikan. Defense Secretary Ash Carter did not specify the number of troops the U.S. will be sending to Iraq to join the 3,500 U.S. troops who are already there. But he was straightforward about the fact that they are going to war. And when Mr. Carter said, we are at war, he was grilled over the administration's authority to declare war without congressional approval. Who declared that war? We view uh, the fight against ISIL as a threat to the United States, and we are mobilizing all of the military capabilities that are necessary. Who would have actually made that declaration? Is that something you would make, the secretary would make? If it was a technical would... declaration of war, it would be the Congress. But has that declaration been made? No, it has not. No, I just want to be candid. I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not using this in some technical sense. But this is serious business. It feels like that to our people who are engaged in it, and it has that kind of gravity. So it's not a technical thing. It's a, it's a uh, descriptive. 
For a long time, the Obama administration has been criticized for refusing to acknowledge that U.S. troops are at war on the ground in Iraq again. Even after a U.S. soldier died in October during a hostage rescue operation, the Obama administration would still say U.S. troops were not engaged in combat. The U.S. Defense Secretary announced this deployment of additional troops on the same day as Germany approved a plan to send 1,200 soldiers to fight ISIL. So the Obama administration may be feeling more confident from a political standpoint to announce such a decision. But are Americans confident about this? According to a Gallup poll from November, 53 percent of Americans opposed sending ground troops to Iraq and Syria to fight ISIL. Another 43 percent were in favor. Many Americans are wary because they remember how the last war in Iraq went. As President Obama himself uh, said, ISIL is a consequence of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. At this Tuesday's hearing in Congress, Ash Carter said, as a recent Iraq war vet, I'm concerned that we're already going back. I'd like to get it right this time, end of quote. Well, as more U.S. troops are heading to Iraq and to Syria, too, we're yet to see signs of Washington getting it right this time. We spoke to the editor of The Nation magazine, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. She believes the U.S. simply needs to rethink its policy in the Middle East. U.S. policymakers have a fateful decision to make at this time. They join in a large coalition, including Russia, Iran, France, or they persist in making Russia the enemy and going in a unilateral direction. I think the latter is a mistake. The temptation of expanding the U.S. military presence is a dangerous one. We need a coalition, as Francois Hollande of France believes, as other European leaders believe, to truly take on the challenge of ISIS. But President Barack Obama has said convincing Moscow to join the U.S.-led coalition against Islamic State will be a tough task. That's as questions are mounting over the capabilities of the alliance. Our coalition is on the offensive. ISIL is on the defensive, and ISIL is going to lose. From what I've seen of what we're doing in Iraq today as we're pushing ISIL back, and we will push him out of Iraq, ultimately. There's no need for another international coalition against ISIL when 60-plus nations are already aligned and having an effect against ISIL. Entry level to the coalition is pretty, pretty easy. Some of the countries just delegitimize, right? ISIL, you just have to say ISIL's bad and you join the coalition. Right? <laughs> uh, I think Andorra's a member. I know they um, haven't I think been launching too many air. Look, I wouldn't say the bar is low. Well, uh, some U.S. allies have even been criticized for hampering the anti-terror efforts in Syria. Uh, Arti spoke to a former prime minister of Lebanon, Michel Aoun. He believes Ankara has been among the major contributors to the spread of the jihadists. Speaking of Turkey's role in the fight against terrorism, I don't know for certain if they still carry on with what they started. But it was Ankara that was reinforcing the front line with radical terrorists. It seems to me this turned out to be the root of the conflict of interests. It is impossible to succeed in neither a military nor a political solution of the Syrian conflict when one of the neighboring states openly fuels the war and is instigating others to drop the political solution. Meanwhile, a former head of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency has dubbed America as stupid for releasing a future terrorist leader during the Iraq war. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was detained in Fallujah in 2004, but was let go a few months later after being deemed a low-level threat. We were too stupid. We didn't understand who we had there at that moment. When 9-11 happened, emotions took over, and our response was, where did they come from? Let's go kill them. Let's go get them. Instead of asking why they attacked us, we asked where they came from. Then we strategically marched in the wrong direction. Al-Baghdadi heads Islamic State. He's overseen mass executions of civilians in uh, religious and ethnic cleansing and masterminded scores of terror attacks. More than 10 years after his brief detention, the U.S. is now desperate to recapture him, offering a $10 million bounty. 
Uh, we spoke to former CIA officer Jack Rice. He says the decision to release the terrorist has now come back to haunt Washington. Well, it's very embarrassing. I mean, if we sit down and we think about the reality of what we're facing right now, that's exactly what happened. He was kept in southern Iraq, and they just assumed uh, that he was a low-level operator and released him. But we have to remember, we were holding people, and I say we, meaning the United States, was holding people by the tens of thousands. What we're seeing from the West, primarily from the United States right now, is this philosophical belief that if we take out ISIL, that all of a sudden it's all going to be good. But that simply is a pipe dream. I mean, there is the reality here that there was a vacuum that was created in Iraq long before there was a vacuum created in Libya. And that's something that the U.S. is facing right now. The idea of lopping off the head of one individual is somehow going to magically make this organization disappear is ridiculous.